Welcome to Attack of Opportunity. Hello and welcome to Attack of Opportunity. Today, a last minute drop in my hat. We are so lucky to have Mr. David Fryant with us from Nerdarchy. And we're going to grill him. We're going to fry him up. Uh, that, sorry, that doesn't mean to be a play on your last name. David, thank you so much for being on the show today. Uh, thanks for having me on. I really do appreciate it. And uh, what else am I going to do on a Friday afternoon? <laughs> Get ready for game of gaming prep and doing these interviews. And uh, we play tonight. Do you uh, do you have your scheduled game all set up for a Friday night or are you a different day? Uh, actually, we are gaming Friday night. We are actually streaming a game tonight. Uh, the World of Revlo. And their, their creator is going to be DMing for us. I don't know if you've checked out Revlo or uh, oh, yeah. Creature Curators. They do awesome stuff. So we're we'll hanging out with them tonight. Great, great. Well, the question we always love to ask first of our victims here on Attack of Opportunity is how did you first realize that you were a geek, a nerd, one of us, one of us? Hmm. You know, I it, it happened when I was really young. Um, one, like my dad always watched like sci-fi type stuff and fantasy stuff. So I would watch that with him, you know, and I remember vaguely remember going and seeing Star Wars in the movie theater when I was a kid. Uh, but, you <laughs> How know, old were you? <laughs> I was five when that came yeah, out. <laughs> well, I was born in 75. So like it was, you know, it wouldn't have been the first one. <laughs> you would have been like three. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, but more than likely I was lugged along. Um, but yeah, and then like I remember being in kindergarten and my next door neighbor, Ian Wilson, coming over with the red box. And I didn't know what it was. Uh, and, you, you know, he's talking about, you know, gnomes and halflings and fighters. And, uh, you know, he had funny shaped dice. And then soon after that, he also introduced me to some of his friends and they were playing Gamma World, the first edition. So like they're my earliest like nerdy geeky moments that I can remember. I remember the red box. That was my first. Uh, I know Gamma World, though I never had a chance to play it. We got into something called Travelers. But the red box, that was already sort of, I guess it's sort of the second beyond their really, really old 70s editions that they put out. Red box was a first love for a lot of us during that time. Um, so I was going to say, you know, like, was there a defining moment or like a gateway drug that we joke that like video games or a lot of people coming up in the 90s playing second edition, getting addicted like myself to Larry Elmore art and Jeff Easley art and stuff, uh, Harry Potter making everything cool to be a nerd. Was there something, was it like you said, dads and sci-fi? type of thing that kind of got you into it? The, you're watching Science International and Doctor Who at night, like my old man, as opposed to, you know, beer and hockey night? So it was, you know, it was a combination of that being in, in the household um, when, I, when I was real little. And, you know, just like, you know, back then you just like had a friend that was into that stuff. For us, there was an older kid in the neighborhood. You know, the, the kid that originally introduced to me, he was a couple years older and he showed me the stuff and it was super cool. And then I went and touch it for years later. And I remember, um, you know, one of the girls we would hang out with had a much older brother. And he, you know, we were, we were like tweens, early teens. And he was like 18. So like he was practically adult, 17, 18. So we all looked up to him. Sometimes he would play like backyard sports with us. But, you know, I just remember one day him bringing out like the D&D books and being like, do you got you kids want to play some Dungeons and Dragons? And that was like, that was it. Like that summer we, that we did that, like almost every day, we just totally <laughs> immersed in it. Keep you in the shade under a tree and dice don't roll really well in the grass type of thing. But, uh, Oh yeah, absolutely. You know, I was just a D and D in a castle. Right. And one of the, one of the suggestions was like, Hey, cause we're looking for different gaming spaces. And one of the suggestions was the gazebo. And I was like, no, thank you. I'm flashing back to my childhood when we're trying to play on the step or on a deck or something and your your papers and your books are blowing all over the place <laughs> i remember gaming uh trying to do the Dragonlance campaign for its eighth time restart the first adventure over and over and we'd be sitting around a campfire in someone's backyard like eight of us you know and it's this great ambience the campfire but the dm is like i'm oh i can't see there's no light you know you yeah. can't see your own notes um actually brings my next question how long have you been gaming how long have you been a gamer you know, it's, it's uh, right around the 30 year mark, give or take, you know, like I said, I was introduced early, but then I wouldn't really start playing 
for several years later. Yeah. You know, I was introduced, I was probably, I want to say I was like in kindergarten. So I was like five or six. And then we played like a little bit, like, and in all honesty, the thing that I actually remember about playing was it wasn't, it wasn't my character. It was playing Gamma World. And I remember my brother wanted to be a hawk person. And, but it was Gamma World. So Gamma World is like really, really weird. And he was a hawk person, but he was like 20 feet tall or something. Do you remember the old Buck Rogers sci fi on TV? My old man watched that, and there's a very. Oh, yeah, yeah. You know, Swiggy the, the robot. And they had, yeah, and remember they had his buddy. He was like their version of a Vulcan. He was this very serious hawk man. And the very, yeah. very first episode, he had his hawk wife, and she unfortunately dies, and he just suddenly has this life debt to Buck and follows him around. I'm just curious if yes. that might have been your brother's inspiration for, like, you know, said hawk guy in space. It, it might have been. It, it um, lines up he was a couple line. years uh, younger than me, and he, or he just might have won a wings. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so you got into RPGs right away, even before um, getting into some maybe some people at the gateway drug is like an RPG video game or reading, you know, dad's fantasy novel. Let's clarify, right? right? When I was a kid, like Atari and ColecoVision, they were the thing. Yeah. Now, so so video games weren't quite what they were now. Like an RPG. You know, an RPG video game that wasn't really a thing when I was first introduced to. You don't remember video the text, games. the text ones? It was just a line of text going, "You are here in the forest. What do you do?" And we would try and figure out the code. Going, I go left, I go north, I go east, and then finally goes, "Oh, you go east. You continue east down a path." You don't remember those? Those were early, early. But technically, well, wasn't that still PC? Uh we had one for. Um, was it like a Vic twenty or a, it was it was a cartridge? I remember slamming it in there. Anyway, sorry. Um, yeah, I digress. So you're you're gaming along, and I hate to break this to you, sir, but it's probably over thirty years because if I'm at thirty plus years and I didn't start playing till I was sixteen, uh, you've you're definitely at thirty plus years of, of a gamer. But respect, respect. But yeah, like, it what, doesn't matter, you know. It's, <laughs> it, you know, it doesn't like um, I don't know. I saw a thing on Twitter the other day about people and talking about how long they've been gaming uh, you know as i don't know some people almost use it like a like a cudgel so oh, it's off putting oh. No, no, no! Don't don't misunderstand me. I um, no, no, I, I don't. I, I'm just I, saying. I, I like the idea of somebody going, "Hey, do you remember then? Remember yeah. then?" And he's like, Dee -dee, "I remember this. I remember Buck Rogers." But um, I've met people across the board. I've met DMs two years in, six months in, and they've got me beat hands down. And they've giving advice and all this stuff. And I'm like, "Oh, wow, this is so great!" Because truth about gaming is truth about gaming. If you get onto something and then you want to help your players and the dm starts going we should try this we could try this you should do this or even if they tweet about it the fun the love and the truth about gaming is there it's in the context it didn't mean sorry i didn't mean like check out your medals going across yeah. the chest there mon general um but uh you're going along you're gaming for years what makes you switch from the 99 percent of content you know intake and wanting to be entertained as most do to the one percent of blood sweat and tears of becoming a content creator what made you decide to actually create content put it on the web and go i love this so much i'm going to share this you know worldwide with strangers so originally i didn't intend on doing it <laughs> and, and, you know <laughs> you were so there's, there, <laughs> there, there's like two people in my life that convinced me that this is kind of what i should be doing um, one was a friend of mine and a childhood friend as well as mentor in my life for certain things. And, you know, I was involved with internet marketing and network marketing um, online already. And he was kind of like, well, you should, you should, you're a dungeon master. You should D &D, do, do something with D&D online. I'm like, nobody cares about that. There's not, nothing going on there. And, and then soon after that, my youngest brother, not the Hawkeye, but a, a different brother, uh, who he, he actually convinced me to start Nerdarchy. He was, you know, he was living in New Mexico. He wanted to come back to uh, the Philadelphia area. We're from Jersey. He's like, we should do something with like indie board games or something. And I'm like, ah, like I like board games and tabletop games, but I I wouldn't say that was like my jam. Like my thing is definitely role playing games. And when we first started out, we just started poking around. First, we wanted to see if it was actually a thing. And we found like Arm, uh, Andrew Armstrong, who was going strong. There was a, after him, there was a bunch of like smaller creators. But then there was Noah Atwiler, uh, Counter Monkey, like his channel 
we looked at that a lot and he had like 30,000 subscribers and that was like huge back then. And so I was like, oh, I guess people do do this. And, and that's kind of like how we started. Cool. How long has this been going on? Was Nerdarchy your first, uh, you know, like your first content that you created? It, uh, I used to do stuff about internet marketing online and ran a website and, you know, th had thrown up some videos before, but like, I've never created content like this. And I was so much more passionate about, you know, playing Dungeons and Dragons and tabletop games and role playing than anything else that I've ever done. So we've been at it for five years now. Um, and I think we're heading into year six, we're in year six now. And uh, when we started doing it, we started off with the website because I knew I wanted to have like our own real estate online, you know, yeah, obviously you grab all the socials, but primarily we're, we're known for videos and YouTube. Mm -hmm. But the problem with like YouTube, Twitch and all that stuff is like, you never actually really own any of those places. You're like a, you're really like a tenant without a lease. So <laughs> yeah, that's why we always, that's why we had initially decided we would also start with a website as well so if anything ever happened we have a place to put our stuff yeah yeah we recently very very recently it's kind of uh, a deconstruction because we have our own website now and this here actually is a vodcast as well if you're listening or watching on stream a podcast now podcast is our go-to but we finally got our our website up running but we do like to put any any and all video as minor as it is in our grand scheme of things on YouTube uh, just so because there's an audience that wants to sort of see and sing along or listen along whether they can just see the combat grid the minis or they just have a face to appear to and watch the emotions as the interview goes on or as the game goes on uh, as opposed to just listening and they can have it all up in their head now I'm assuming this is why stream is so big is people really like that sort of live in the moment maybe they'll screw up maybe they'll giggle and laugh it's not um kind of what we do where everything is polished edited music added that type of thing there's an audience in each social media a facebook audience a youtube audience a podcasting audience some are on itunes this type of thing you started off on youtube and like you said you're renting now you have your own youtube channel and now you have that control you are the landlord as it were with your video content can put what you want what else goes there and what have you got coming up so you know we put out videos monday wednesday and friday at 6 a.m eastern time every week and you know that it's kind of a potpourri of whatever we feel like putting up at the time um uh, but more more recently we've been working or threatening threatening to launch a kickstarter for the past two years and finally that's going to come to fruition so monday if people go check out nerdarchy on Kickstarter, you'll you'll be able to check that out. Out of the box encounters, we're super excited. Uh, we had this series actually that started on our website called Out of the Box Encounters, and uh, our writer Mike Gould would take. He's another old head who's been doing this for a very long time, but he would take that experience and write encounters that were kind of just drop in your game, and they always had like a unique perspective to them and. He's well known for taking into the account the crazy, zany things that players will try and want to do when he made these encounters. So we're like, this is so good. We need to, we need to make it look better and put it out there. And that's why we were, we're launching the Kickstarter so we can put art and maps and get it professionally edited and all that fun stuff. Oh, cool. Um, now, is your Kickstarter currently up and running? And what is, uh, what, is it like Nerd Artie's this... Kickstarter? Where can we find that? Uh, when this goes live, it probably will be. I mean, when you video, if you're listening, hmm. uh, it will be. But Monday, the 15th of July, it will be live. If you basically Google Nerdarchy, you will come up and you'll be able to track us down. Once that once that sucker is live, you'll be seeing it everywhere, it's, you know, on our YouTube, Twitter, Facebook. Well, we'll make uh, sure you're actually going to be tired of saying <laughs> I'll that. make sure this goes everywhere that I have on the 14th and then everyone will be ready for the 15th. <laughs> we'll push you up the line as it were. Um, so you, you have, you're taking inspiration from your old hobby. You've got friends and family, you know, whispering in your ear going, you can do this. This is what you should be doing. And you're doing the, Hmm, really? And then and now here you are five years later. Um, your nerdarchy is a, is a household name, as we say in the, in, in the communities. Um, did you know that as long as you have 30,000 under your banner, you're considered an official minor celebrity and you've got to be careful of 
you know, what you hold up in the camera and what you promote. It's just hit the media right now. Now, usually I stay away from current media events and politics, um, but this is something that actually directly affects a content creator like yourself, where you get into that 10,000, 30,000, 50,000 follower subscriber range, and it opens a brand new gate of lawyers and problems and the world and the country going, no, no, no. Now there are rules and laws. You can't just make this joke or hold up this product or, you know, chug down your Coke or whatever. Um, with you rapidly, if not capping those numbers, how do you feel about this sort of sudden overreach of internet control? YouTube especially has suddenly gone blam, all this violence and stuff had to be capped. A lot of people are leaving it. Now we're talking about they're looking directly at your numbers and someone like YouTube or just the internet in larger going, nope, you know, you gotta be careful. You gotta do this, you gotta do that. Do you feel it's sort of a, you're kind of restricting your freedom of speech? Do you think it restricts your content personally? How do you feel about that? All right, so he, here's my feelings about freedom of speech. You have it, but you don't have it on other people's platforms, right? So like I hear everyone cry and whine about it on YouTube and Facebook, but like you don't own those things. You can go on the street corner, yell whatever you want, you know? I mean, there might be consequences, but you can do it. No one, you know, no one's really gonna stop you. You have that right. But when you're on when you're on social media, and YouTube's just another form of social media, you whatever rules they set, you have to follow, or you know, or you're gonna find yourself not there. You know, I don't actually know what the 30,000 is all about. I vaguely saw it and had not really looked into it. So, so from what you're saying, it sounds like something I have to look into. Now. I, I caught it on Instagram. Somebody was yeah. promoting, and I believe the number was around 30,000. Sorry, uh, I do apologize. It is sort of a loaded question for me to spring on you. And you're right. Like A lot of people have gotten so used to being able to be anonymous online, saying what they want, yeah. trolling what they want, doing what they want type of thing. They forget about the responsibility of how anything you say and do can come across the eyes and ears of anybody, another country, little children. People have their own view, and it just sparks and off and off and off it goes. And a lot of people don't realize the responsibility they have as a content creator, let alone just as a viewer on social media. It's free to put there, but like yeah. you said, you're not gonna be there long if you dig a trench in one type of thing or that type of thing. Uh, I have a reputation for being um, just saying stuff and I'm so excited. And then in my brain, to my mouth, to my texting fingers, my tone is always misinterpreted. I've got my 19 year old son going, dad, you can't say that. It sounds very condescending. I'm like what, I'm asking them a question. No, no, you can't do this, you can't do it. So I'm luckily I'm reined in a little bit by a wife and family or whatever. Um, and it doesn't matter, my defense, how pure my intent is or how curious I am about something or just wanna know because I'm 47 and I just used to going up to people going, hey, I have a question for you. Can I ask you this type of thing? If you put that kind of thing on social media, believe, people believe that your question is actually your stance. If yeah. you're asking about this, I'm asking about, well, why why do I have to adhere to these laws? Who cares about my 50,000 followers or what you know, type of thing? People automatically just dig in going, well, that's how he feels about it. So I apologize for such a loaded question. Let's get back to the, the interview um, at hand. We've talked about how long you've been creating. We've talked about uh, what's coming up. What about future projects? Have you got something on the horizon that you're trying to put together? A sneak peek, a whisper, a teaser uh, you're putting together with people or a new project for yourself beyond the Kickstarter? So right now it's just <laughs> beyond that. That's enough right now. To be honest with you. Sorry, like, you got you got like yourself. I think you said multiple projects. You know, like yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. we um, um... <laughs> we this this summer has just been so busy. The first half of this year, we kind of like quiet, chugging along, getting ready for things. Um, we did D and D in a castle in the UK. I was actually at two different castles. You know, cut. Yeah, you know, I come back. You know, a week later, we're launching a Kickstarter. We just had we just had a couple of our products put in the latest humble bundle. Mm -hmm. um, which was supporting the charity Rain, which is awesome. Uh, then Gen Con's coming up, so we'll be there. And one of the other brands that I'm part owner of is Saber Dice, and we'll be doing a live show there. Mm -hmm. And Keystone Comic Con had reached out to us. They want someone to talk about streaming D&D. So I'm going to be working with a couple of other creators and influencers to put together um, some, some panels over there. Uh, I'll be hitting up. We'll be hitting up Pax Unplugged because it's pretty local for us. We feel guilty if we don't go. And then uh, we're also going. I'll also be at Game Hole Con. So you can find me at any of those places. Uh, and then we're also on the we're also on the schedule next year for D and D in a Castle, 2020, uh, the September 10th through 14th. At the very least, we'll be there. So. 
So are you guys, as opposed to the, the virtual green screen background of Stonewall, you guys are sitting in the big hall? Or do you guys like sort of LARP it and move around the rooms? Uh, so it's up. So, okay. So Nerdarchy was a headliner at our own castle this year. And we had the freedom to do it however you want it. Um, it was scheduled where they'd move you from different rooms on different days just for different ca castle experiences. But if you wanted to pick up your table, uh, not literally, figuratively, and go somewhere else in the castle and do a scene or something like that, that was totally viable. Other GMs have done that. Uh, I think for us, mostly, we stayed stayed in location. Jeremy Crawford, a lot of times, would take his table and go on road trips. Um, when I was in France and they did it last year, GM Tim, he would uh, he he at least a couple times he grabbed us and would do a scene somewhere else as well. So the, you know, it really just depended on the particular GM and their style and how they wanted to do it. So it could very much be kind of like LARPing, or it could be you know traditional D and D just in a cool setting. I believe um, like the uh, Uncommon Trust and the Library Bards, they were headlining their own castles and. I believe they brought like entourages with them and they would have people play as NPCs and stuff. So that is definitely to me a lot more like LARPing where I would say that our games are probably a lot more like traditional D and D. I mean, it doesn't matter how you do it. There's no wrong way, uh, but just different styles. That's see, that's a Wrigley field moment for me. Like you know, baseball fans are like, they, they'll be allowed to walk out or throw the first ball and on, on Wrigley field. I just saw, I follow the glass cannon podcast. They're one of my favorites. And, uh, Skid Meyer was in the audience wooting as Nick Lowe, who writes for Spider-Man comics. He got to throw the first ball at, at, at the games. I don't say it's Wrigley, Wrigley field, but, um, that, that emotion you could hear in Skid's voice to have you guys at a castle. Now, my mom was born in North Britain, so I'm half British. So I was raised on Benny Hill, Coronation Street, all that stuff. I would love to go to the UK. I have yet to go there. And to, like you said, just a game in the castle. Like, talk about getting your geek on. A lot of people are like, well, what's the point of that? They're just sitting around. It's like, no, no, you don't get it. You're standing on stones and structures that are hundreds of years old. Um, the ambience that comes when a DM sets up a room or putting up the little candles and everything. Can you just imagine, ladies and gentlemen, the ambience of sitting in that cold? I, I, man, I just envy you. <laughs> it's uh, yeah, like, going, so it's like, wow. Like, that is it, really cool. It's a high, it was a very high end vacation for these people. Um, and but I want to say, like, the castle did you know, went so far as in selling the experience to them, like, just being there. And it's like you said, it's just like the ambience just like seeps in the history. Oh, yeah. Like, this was literally built to you know as a fortification to stave off assaults and attacks yes yes i i'd be sitting there i would dig out first edition dungeons and dragons castle ravenloft that had the fold out three-dimensional map for a dm that was the first you know, the people i was flashing this around when i was a kid like it was a pinup right the, the first one of the first maps that were drawn in, like in the blue map style but it was three-dimensional and you could see the exploded view of the entire castle and the floors and i used to geek out of this map all the time if i was in a castle that is what i would slam down in front of my players and just go look check it out this is where you are now but um Bring I don't know if question. that was the first, but it's got to be like super early for isometric maps. Oh, probably. Sorry, probably uh, not the very first. Uh, first for me, or the first castle that I'd seen with. No, a, no, with I'm, a I'm saying like I, that's the first one that I remember like that. Yeah, yeah. yeah I, I don't know. You know, I don't know how early it was, but I feel like it was pretty early at the very least. Like six to nine levels of an actual spired castle blown apart for the DM to go, <laughs> and the players have no idea what's coming. Um, so may, stuff, may I ask sure. a couple of personal questions? You know, you can you can head off to Europe and you can do these awesome things in the gaming community. Um, we're all living vicariously through you now, hopping castles and whatever. But uh, what may I ask? What do you do for a living at the moment? Or uh, what you were? All right. So you? I am a professional nerd at Nerdarchy. Okay. Uh, that's that's my full time job. I I've done I've done so many different jobs. Uh, in, you know, throughout my, I, I I can barely say I've had a career. You know, before this, <laughs> I, wor I worked in and around the construction a lot, and for a decade before this, I was doing road construction, heavy construction, hmm. and I left that behind to, to to uh, to do nerdarchy. So I you know after doing both part time for two years, three years, you know I went full time with it, which well, was a, a leap. 
the reason I asked this, you were saying earlier, oh, it doesn't matter how many years you DM, and I agree. Um, and it doesn't matter what background you come from, ethnicity, or what you did for a living while you're gaming. I just still find it interesting to find that gamers come from every walk of life, every background, mm -hmm. and every job description. I've met doctors that are gamers. Teachers are a big thing now, talking about bringing the game to their students in their off time, because you hear the art programs and the music programs are always being cut by schools, and you have DM teachers that are like, you know what, I'm going to do this for my kids because it is invoking their imaginations and our listeners always find that interesting it's just kind of like a i won't say a humble beginning but uh just one of the many 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 types of backgrounds working class blue collar whatever you want to call it and it's okay to game like everyone has their hobby their that stereotype of being an it technical nerd or the stereotypes of living in your mom's basement and not having a job aren't necessarily the 90 to 100 percent of gamers at least not anymore and i always love asking that question um we so uh, you know our fans range far and wide and you know it was really surprising how many doctors and attorneys and and people that have you know high-end professions <laughs> that follow us you want to talk about a rules lawyer i am a lawyer they, 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 yeah, yeah, these yeah, messages exactly. and, and you know and me and ted were not particularly articulate you know i've been a blue collar worker all my life matter of fact when ryan was a part of nerdarchy and i would do social media stuff and i would sometimes put stuff on me he's like oh that's so blue collar like it was an insult i'm like what do you want what do you want from me i am blue collar that's where i come from yeah. Uh, so I'm always so I'm always amazed, like you said, like how far and wide, you know, nerddom has has, has spread. Well, you could still pull something from it. Um, for instance, we're looking at the Pathfinder edition called Pure Steam to get our steampunk on in a show. And we're talking about converting one of the first edition ones and we're auditioning a DM and all this stuff. One of my guys is an electrician by trade. So he's very excited to play pure steam, like a Victorian age, everything is brass, steam, and that sort of electrical current coming through. And he has all kinds of ideas for a new character class there that's called a gearhead, where you get to sort of Wild West and Victorian age invent things. And of course, he's pulling on real knowledge as an electrician, but then you get to mix it with fantasy. Now, all you really need is your imagination. You don't have to be a doctor to be an alchemist. You don't have to be uh, any kind of poet or public speaker to play a bard. That's the best thing about RPGs. But I really find it interesting, uh, again, asking that question, what you do for a living, because I know that people always bring it into their game. Uh, I have one of our female cast members study to be a forensicist. So she's checking out the frayed rope and going it from a CSI, um, you know, point of view of who sprung this trap. And it always gives more to the game and having that diverse uh, background always gives to the game. But I got to say, nothing beats um, playing with the sort of the camaraderie that you built either in a community or people have become your friends or whatever, having that, um, I know you, you know me kind of feel and having them at your table in an actual space and it becomes your Friday night poker. Uh, now, unfortunately we, our show, we actually, we have half our cast is in the U S half of our cast is in Canada and we're doing what we do now. We have a zoom call set up and everything. And we do a whole bunch of editing tricks to try and make it sound like we are you know, oh, you, oh, you in the, on the same table in the same room, as opposed to four heads on the screen playing Hollywood squares. Um, my next question for you is because you are so social media and internet saturated, um, do you have time for that at home off the air game with your private group? Or even just when you said, when you go to the castle and everything, do you have a lot of that or is now like us, have you had to push right into the virtual? Tomorrow night, I play my home game. <laughs> oh, okay, okay, so, that's good. <laughs> now, we don't do it a lot. Like, so for a while, what we were doing, and I mean, even for a while, we were recording them and putting them up, but we actually stopped doing that. But what, um, what we were doing for a while was Ted would run a game, I would run a game, and then we would have like a third DM come in and run a game. And they were all in-person games. Now, speaking of in-person, I've got a lovely photo up here for the vodcast aspect. Sorry if you're just listening to this, the podcast, but for the stream and for our vodcast aspect on YouTube at Rollmongers Podcast Networks, there's a lovely picture of you and two gentlemen. And I wouldn't say you're all giving the finger guns, but there's a bunch of guys all going, hey, 
yeah, yeah. No, no, you're the guy to whoever's holding the camera. You got your logo up there. Can you possibly tell me who's here? I have sure. Three, you've got three bearded folk. There's a gentleman with a slight ginger beard and short hair and glasses in the middle. And then there's just to be funny and weird, I got to say that the guy on the right is uh, destined to be on Duck Dynasty. <laughs> Can you? <laughs> So uh, the Duck Dynasty guy is my brother-in-law, Ted. Okay. Sorry, Ted. Hi, Ted. Co-host. Love that show. To see you on it. Uh, uh, Nate used to do stuff with us, but he's moved on to a trucking career. And then there is myself, who uh, my appearance changes quite often depending on uh, Beardomancy. Yeah. <laughs> um, speaking of beard and bearded classes, do you have a favorite character class? that you just love to go back to? Like, obviously, everyone wants to try everything and, you know, be yourself. But, like, is, is the beard here rocking a sort of a pro-Gandalf approach to gaming? You have a, or do you have a favorite? Uh, you know, I think it's more pro-dwarf. It's yeah. re- I really struggle to make to make a new character and not make it a dwarf. Okay. So you have a racial love for the dwarves. What about character class? Character class? Uh, you know, I'm all over the place. I mean, I just we just finished Ted's game, and I played a war wizard... Eldritch Knight, uh, Mountain Dwarf from first level to 20th level. Now we're playing his game and I'm playing a human, uh, you know, one level dip of fighter, but everything else is rogue. So I just try and play different things that I haven't been playing. Um, you know, right now on our Saver Dice game, we're playing Starfinder. I'm playing a Soki um, mechanic with a bad attitude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> kind of like like a Johnny Rotten kind of vibe to him. Yeah. And then like, uh, like, it, like the Russian from Armageddon, he's up there and he's like, American, Russian, everything comes from Japan. And he's just banging away on the on the engine. They're like in space where if you pop this capsule, like everyone will get vaped in the, the cold. Yeah. That kind of guy. And uh, yeah, I'm also playing a Goblin Ranger in one of our other games. So I'm all over the place here. You know, I just try and mix it up and play something that I haven't played before or recently. How many systems are you playing right now? How many different, uh, de- like... Right now, just, uh, we're playing 5e, we're playing Starfinder. Um, honestly, I would love to play more, but there just isn't time. Okay. I'm just curious, because we, we've broken into, we've started with Pathfinder First Edition, we're looking at Second Edition, we're playing what they call a dead system of Star Wars, the Saga Edition, but because it's the Dawn of Defiance campaign, our We Shot First podcast covers what we consider as canon material between the third and fourth movie, and there's all this good hype, bad hype of Star Wars owned by Disney going in the future, we still think this is relevant, and we're doing it for love. Is there an older system that you still play or like to go back to, or even like rules lawyer your way back to because you just thought it was a better ruling on a similar situation? Do you have a first love or a, a go-to system despite you playing what you're playing now that might be your favorite or always be your favorite? I wouldn't say it's a go-to, but we have two seasons of Marvel Phase Rip on our channel. Oh, yeah. Uh, we have played Cypher System. Uh, basically, we use the Shadowrun campaign setting, but we ran it with Cypher System. We've done that on the channel. We've done Open Legend. Uh, we've done Star Wars, the, the you know the newer version. Um, we've done Mutants and Masterminds. I feel like there's probably a bunch more too. If I like sift through the sift through our catalog, but it, you know we've done Fate Accelerated on the channel. So we've done a bunch of different things. And us as gamers, we're always open to playing new games. Um, just right now with having families running nerdarchy ted still has a muggle job it just you know we just don't have enough time for all the great amazing games that are out yeah there. do you ever play any palladium back in the day the d20 system palladium had ninjas super spies to be honest with you riffs? palladium drove me to find mutants and masterminds oh is that right um, you looked at it and went no there's got to be something so, else <laughs> that, so like, I, I was playing it but like the palladium system like while interesting i just hate that it's so 80s in its design and mm-hmm. Like the the this it's so swingy from character to character. Mm-hmm. So when we when we wanted to do a supers game, we started with that. I, I was like, there's got to be something better. Like I was like, even like we should just go back and play Marvel Phase Rip mm-hmm. at this rate. Uh, I just thought it felt like it was a cleaner, more elegant system. And then, you know, and then like when I started poking around, uh, every the champions kept coming up and mutants and masterminds kept coming up, but. I was familiar with D20, so I was like, well, this is easy enough. There there won't be nearly as much to learn. 
And so we started messing around with Mutants and Masterminds second edition. Um, and then third edition for Mutants and Masterminds came out, which was great. It's like they really started like pulling out and getting rid of the D and D isms and making it their own game and made it feel more like a superhero game. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so they like that was definitely one of the better um edition upgrades that I've seen. I, I am familiar with mutants. Uh, I have Hero Lab, and I poked at some of their freeware and the idea of that you c- you create a character and it asks about what type of attack you have, and it could be anything, energy, throwing daggers, whatever, and it talks about the dice you would use for that way of you know attacking or defending yourself, and it's completely open for flavor in that system. Uh, and it balances what, the dice, you know, like the dice are balanced for your level, but what comes at your opponent could be just about anything. And I thought that was one of the coolest things that was sort of away from the D&D static. This dagger is D4. It's a, yeah. um, one, it's classless. Yeah. It's a classless system. And then two, it's a, it's what they would call effect-based. And that's what you're describing. Like the effect is what happens. That's the mechanics. Mm-hmm. But then you would add a descriptor because say if it's a ranged damage attack, well, you're using bullets or you're using a blast of fire or you're throwing scorpions at people, whatever, hmm. it, you know, it's just, then that was one of the cool things about it. And it makes the system really easy to run because once you know the numbers, like then you can describe, the, describe things anyway and doing things on the fly are so simple because you know, oh, they're a power level 10 party. So the defenses against them have to be, you know, somewhere is in a swing of 20, right? Because it's either take away or add 10 Hmm. to the number, uh, which probably sounds more confusing me describing it than how it actually works. No, no, but like I said, looking at the rules, um, I wish other games would do that is they, they, they have a sort of a generic way of presenting the rule set and always hinting at, and it's your game, and it's your guy, and it's your hero or whatever, and you can do what you want. And like I said, even though it was just math, 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 I could visualize maybe umpteen characters doing things and going this is really good it's very simple you know the defense thing having that like a toughness number so you could throw superman all around you know and it's not a direct hit point damage you had to sort of overwhelm the guy's toughness to actually take any sort of lasting damage which means you could throw people all over the place and have a real action sequence where isn't just like oh one hit sorry bob you start rolling new guy we'll continue you know stopping the bond villain over here Although um, with really good and really bad rolls, one hit will do it. Yeah. And that game like any other, you know. But uh, so a buddy of mine really had issues with that game because he just likes hit points, right? He wants mm. to do damage and he wants to take damage. And that system just doesn't use hit points. Okay. Now I have an optional question for you because like I said, I already, sure. I already stumbled a little bit with a very loaded question. Uh, I'm curious because well, like you said, what you say can really sway people um what's your take on the second edition pathfinder that's coming my understanding from my own cast we did a one shot uh, everyone was doing doomsday dawn and not only did i find doomsday dawn to be missing two adventures because if you actually look through the dm's description bah, 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 bad guy evil sorcerer hey look the hollow it's like i know that adventure i ran in tune with the pharaohs and the packstone pyramid which was written for 3.5 but was on the glorian world that is the adventure in the context of the story of doomsday dawn that's missing they just well we're not going to go back to that i can understand why they're very long adventures to play on their own but it's a huge part of the story and if we ever did second edition we might revisit that and try and convert it just to be original so trying to be original we went to one of the pathfinder society adventures and we found arc lord's envy a delightful little thing happening in sort of arabian nights murder mystery uh and we have it under the attack of opportunity banner on one of our shows as a one shot coming away at the end we went around the cast what did you like what did you not like and this was the beta and the consensus was yes no on the fence or well it's a beta they're gonna fix things so I'm curious, we were just talking about a game mechanic here f- for Mutant Masterminds. For the second edition game mechanic, is there anything that you really like that would draw you to second edition or anything that would put you off? So I really, it's really challenging, right? Because one, I have not really looked at it that much. As a matter of fact, like one of the reasons we went to Mutants and Masterminds was we played fourth edition for a little while and because that was so different, it was easy for us to make a big change and play a completely different game. And then we just started playing everything through it. We would like ran Dresden files, we ran fantasy, but, you know, being someone who was there through, you know, the kind of like the birth of Pathfinder 
uh, you know, part like my interpretation of it is Pathfinder was partly born in rage. Like people were angry with the switch of a new edition changing the game. And Pathfinder was like, hey, you can still play your game. Here it is, um, which their game is still somebody else's game. And now they're going to do a second edition of somebody else's game. But I find that Pathfinder players like crunchy, mechanics heavy, heavy games, right? That's what Pathfinder does, and it does it really well. It's good for that. Mm-hmm. Um, where do you go with a second edition, right? Generally, you streamline when you move to another edition, or you change things a lot. Now, for folks that Pathfinder is their first game, probably doesn't matter too much. You're going to get your normal, you know, angst over a new edition that you always get. You know, some people will be into it, some people won't. But like, I'm really curious about folks who came from 3.5 to Pathfinder, and now Pathfinder is kind of doing what 3.5 did back then and moved to another game. So I'm kind of cur- like, I'm curious to see where it goes. But again, also I'm like, well, what are they going to do? Where? How do they streamline the game and make it still Pathfinder and not simplify it like maybe like a game like 5e? So I don't know. Like I, I'm just cur- I'm curious to see what they do with it. Mm-hmm. I've only been looking a little bit only because we've been kind of playing 5e for so long now. Mm-hmm. And we've been happy with that system because for us, like that system been, has been like an amalgamation of everything like we've always liked about D&D. Mm-hmm. So I haven't looked that deep, you know, a little bit, they send me some stuff. I take a look, but for the most part, um, I probably won't check it out that much. Okay. Uh, I wouldn't dare try to explain my version of what I think. I know the combat mechanic uh, is a bit of a change up. They're getting away from swift action. What you can do as a move action and what you can do as a standard action. And they say, okay, here's an action economy where you have three actions that are open. And then they talk about a whole bunch of things that could fit, that they're all all different, but they all fit into any of these three actions. And every player gets three full actions around. But there are some catches. A spell, which is verbal, is an action. A spell that's somatic, verbal and somatic, is two actions. Verbal, somatic material is three. So you'd have a guy that could cast a verbal spell and do a double move, or a guy who casts a regular spell with material components, and he pretty much has to stand there. Which can ch- that's just the caster dynamic changing hugely. Mm-hmm. There's you have a warrior going, you have a shield. Do you want it up? Well, that's an action. Otherwise, no AC bonus, right? Uh, there's so they found ways that could tricky limit you, but they've also found ways of having an option where a player could literally have a triple run or a triple attack as long as there's penalties negative five, negative five. You know what I mean? You have a first level character just going all Dritz to Erden and you just hold a bunch of penalties. Um, and I don't think that's where the controversy is. That's what people like about the system. The controversy comes in a whole bunch of other things about what they're doing with magical items and everything. Um, but like I said, I, I we're going to look at it. We have ideas to actually, we have a new DM coming, uh, Rob Hammond, we have a new DM coming, um, and we're auditioning these DMs, you know, see if they mesh and everything, and then we're going to launch into these new things. You know, we looked at Starfinder, but we already have Star Wars, that kind of thing. Um, sorry. So, so, you know, I would add to that, though, like one thing. What's that? Right? It, it doesn't matter what Paizo does. It doesn't matter what Wizards Coast does. Like, if you're just a person playing these games, you can just keep playing whatever game you like. You don't have to change, you, you know, you don't have to switch systems. You can keep just playing the game. When I was in the castle, I played first edition Dungeons and Dragons. That was one of the games being run. Stefan uh, Pecorni from Dwarven Forge, that's all he runs. And you can like, you can go on Facebook and find groups that are just AD&D. You know, so yeah, I, I think people get too a little bit too vested in it. Sorry, uh, it, it's it's coming up. August it's about to drop, but I hear yeah. what you're saying. Roll twenty and Fantasy Grounds support a boatload of old editions as well as new editions. Particularly, Roll twenty has uh, all the way back to like D six Star Wars and stuff. You got to play the game for you. Now you were talking about leaving Palladium uh, because it's sort of so eighties or whatever, uh, but people have fond memories of a D six Star Wars, or like you just said, you have fond memories of first edition, and it's a simpler time. Why not? You know, play what you love. You're not being left yes. behind in the dirt because these new editions keep rolling out. 
uh, when fourth edition came out, I pushed it big on my players because I just didn't want to get left behind. And I was really happy for Pathfinder 3.75, and we switched to it eventually because it was more of what we were comfortable with. And it reminded and reflected the 3.5, the 3.0 going all the way back. And that was our comfort zone. Brand new systems, brand new changing dynamic. If you want something new, go into it. But there's nothing wrong with – I recently pitched a podcast playing Redbox to my players going, guys, like Quest for the Heartstone, Castle Amber – I'd love to do these as is, as sappy and as simple as they are, and draw upon the fun of the character creation and you guys role-playing as opposed to having a very overly complex mechanic, like you said, the Pathfinder guys love. There's nothing wrong with that. You know, and gaming stores, you know, you see everyone playing the current whatever at a table, but their shelves are there filled with old editions. And the, the game shop owners that I've talked to have their favorites and love, and they choose to stock this stuff because love of old edition never dies. Um, Swotar, Kotar, the old Xbox game for Knights of the Old Republic, has pushed Disney into the idea of like perhaps our next Star Wars movie will be an Old Republic movie. And me and my guys were like, oh, hell yes. Yes, we're playing Star Wars Saga, not FFG. It's a dead edition. But the Kotar book for Star Wars Saga was the Xbox video game Kotar verbatim. Had the NPCs in it, had every toy, slice, everything. And we just got all excited because that old school memory, that comfort zone. Um, look, there's a movie making it relevant and maybe we could market it, but we're just going to play it anyway. Because, you know, like you said, it's an old edition and we just love it. And we'll, you know, we'll try and carve out that time. But like you said, who has the time? Anyway, I digress. We've been talking to David Fryant from New Nerdarchy. Where can we check you out? You're on YouTube. Nerdarchy, you have- that's something completely different. <laughs> Nerdarchy. <laughs> Nerdarchy. Sorry, from Nerdarchy. I'm a little excited to have you on the show. I'm tripping over my tongue. Where can we find you on the net? Uh, YouTube, Nerdarchy. Facebook, mm-hmm. Nerdarchy. Website, Nerdarchy. Twitter, Nerdarchy. We stay on brand pretty much. Okay. So speaking of brand, do you have merchandise that we can get our hands on? Like we do. We actually, we actually have our own digital products that we put up in our, on our web store, on, on the website. Uh, but we also have a patron where we put them up there first. So and we put them up there for less. So it'll go up on Patreon at least 30 days ahead of time, uh, sometimes more. And then, you know, and then we take them and put them up on the, the web store for other people to purchase them if they like. Wonderful. Well, I actually, I we, we'll have to stop the interview because now I want to go browse all your cool stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, David, thank you so much for being on the show today. You've been listening to Attack of Opportunity, part of the Rollmongers Actual Play Podcast Network, a DiceWise Entertainment production. And David, for someone that just messaged me back on Facebook, it's all about the community. Uh, I got to say that I found you on the air and off the air, very approachable, a great, great fun guest to talk to. And again, thank you so much from our listeners and our cast and those of you listening online for being on our show today. Yep, thanks for having me on. I appreciate it. And we'll see you next time on Attack of Opportunity. <laughs>